Mayad Haldaw, Good Day Buksuans, Welcome to the Botanica Talks, a podcast series of Bukinon State University. I am Dr. Leslie Casas Lubos, botanist, professor, and director of Buxus Botanical Gardens and Herbario. This program brings together scientists, researchers, plant lovers, and environmental advocates to share stories and insights about the fascinating world of plants, especially those thriving in Mindanao's unique ecosystems. For our first episode, we are joined by an internationally renowned bryologist from the California Academy of Sciences whose work spans decades and continents, from the forests of the United States to the tropical mountains of Southeast Asia. Our guest today joins us all the way from California, USA, a name well-regarded with global bryophyte research whose work has shaped our understanding of bryophyte biodiversity. Mr. James R. Shebo. Welcome to Bukidno State University and thank you for being our first guest in our podcast series, Botanica Talks. Thanks, Leslie. It's great to be here. Sir Jim, thank you so much for being with us today. What got you interested in studying bryophytes like mosses and how did that interest grow into a lifetime career? Well, it didn't start with my mosses. It actually, it was a flowering plant botanist in my early years. So I eventually migrated and became very interested in biodiversity and climate change. And I realized the bryophytes were a window into that particular study. Yeah, that's when I was young, I really loved studying plants as well. And one day I noticed that these small green plants, mosses that everyone ignored. I got curious and wanted to learn more over time. And I realized how important they are for the environment and that not many people were studying them. And that's when I decided this is what I want to do as well. You've worked in many places from California to Asia. What made you want to study mosses, liverworts, and hornworts here in the Philippines? Well, I started back in 2002 when I had an opportunity to work in China uh, along the Galigong Shan bordering um, Myanmar. And there I was able to see forests very similar to California, but the bryophytes were completely different, except for a few things and fens were the same species. Mm -hmm. And I was beginning to wonder, why do we have these species that can go across multiple continents and others that are very local. So that began a span of several years in China. And then I worked in Taiwan. And there, those forests are much more similar to California, where we have coniferous forests in the high mountains. Uh, the same genera, Abies, Picea, Calocedrus, and Suga. But the bryoflora was completely different. And so I just found it fascinating that the overstory plants could be the same genera, but the associated bryophytes were all different. So the Philippines is an amazing forest, right? And mountains and plant life. But not many people have studied mosses here. And I saw a big opportunity to help discover new species and to support local scientists. And the more I came, the more I fell in love with the landscapes and the people. Yeah, it's been really great working here in Mindanao. Historically, most biologists who came from Europe or America went to Luzon through Manila. And so the early collecting happened there. And then of course that herbarium was lost in World War II. So all those records yeah. were lost, but there were duplicates in the major herbaria in Europe and America. And so that became a resource to begin to figure out what really is here in Mendenau. There's a lot more species here in Mendenau than we have reports for. And so our job right now is to inventory these amazing mountains and document exactly the biodiversity that's here. Yeah, okay. So how would you describe Mindanao, especially that Bukidnon, from your point of view as a plant scientist? Well, I think probably the most exciting thing I found here now in my eight or so visits is these cloud forest environments from peak to peak are quite different. Even at the same elevation, you would expect to see a very similar bryoflora 
And yet, there are certain things that are common from one place to another, but then there's a whole suite of taxa that we only see like on one peak and nowhere else. And I just find that fascinating, like what's driving that? Mm -hmm. So these bryophytes through long periods of time have had the potential to colonize these habitats and yet they're missing on certain peaks. Yeah. Bukidnon is truly special. Its mountains are full of life. The forests here are still rich, green, and full of mosses, liverworts, and hornworts that I've never seen before. It's a treasure chest of nature, and more people around the world should know about it. Well, that's definitely true, and we have to train our young students to be really good scientists by making excellent voucher specimens and getting them in the barrier so they're available for future studies and students to use. How's your experience been hiking and working in our mountain areas like Mount Kitanglad and Mount Kalatungan? Each peak has been unique. Uh, of course, is accessing through the various tribe that basically lives in those mountains mm -hmm. and working with them and getting their permission. And then uh, realizing the access to many of these peaks is quite different. The first thing I know from hiking other parts of the state is that all the trails just go straight up. Uh, this, that's the quickest way to the point from point A to point B. And so the steep, the trails here are quite steep. And when of course it rains in the cloud forests, uh, those trails can get slippery. And so we have to be kind of cautious to be just, you don't fall too many times. It's been incredible. The hikes are tough, lots of climbing and rain, but the views and discoveries are worth it. I've seen mosses, liverworts, and hornworts covering trees, rocks, and even the ground. Working with local scientists and guides has made the experience even more meaningful. Yeah. Well, every place we've gone, we find new things. That's the great thing about Mendanao. There are so many peaks that no one has been to to do the biodiversity inventory. So we really have no idea how many more species are yet to discover. So what are some of the most interesting mosses you've found here or even liverworts, hornworts? So any interesting species? Well, there's several that I just find fascinating. When I first came across this moss, I didn't even realize it was a moss. I thought it was a fern. It's called uh, Terra Briella. Ah, and it's yeah. about six to eight inches tall on the tree trunks. And it's, it grows erect, upright. And it, and it just looks like a fern. And then I thought, could this possibly be a moss? I just, I was surprised. I'd never seen anything like it. And then on one tree around the corner, I saw developing sporophytes. So I knew it was a moss. And so I finally keyed it out and knew what it was. So that was one that was really exciting to see. And then one we found here recently is a liverwort, a very ancient lineage called Trubia. And it grows along stream banks, a little of small streams and rivers. And it had not been seen in the Philippines for over a hundred years. And we found now several populations of it. But now we know where to look for it. It has a particular habitat that it wants. And once we know where it grows, we can now go there to those kind of places and we can find it. Yeah. So some mosses are big and fluffy. Others are tiny and grow on tree trunks and found some species that could be new to science. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting because it means Mindanao is still full of surprises. And any fun or funny stories during your time in the field? Yeah. I think probably the funniest, well, at the time, it, I didn't feel funny, but afterwards I thought it was kind of funny. When I first came, of course, I was exposed to the rituals with the, with the Datu. And so that was a new experience for me. And so the first time we were in Kitanlad, uh, we were at a very small table. And the Datu was just, just right over here, just a couple of feet from me. And I had my field vest on and, you know, I'm ready to go to the field, waiting for the ceremony. And the Datu is petting the chicken. And I think, and I know what's going to happen to the chicken. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to get blood all over me, you know. I had no idea. I've never seen the ritual before. But the chicken was just so calm. And then the final part of the ceremony, the chicken didn't scream or flop and there was no blood <laughs> running around. So I came across that experience as like, like wow, was, I was kind of amazed as how uh, the chanting from the Datu just calmed the chicken. And we had the ceremony and it was great. But all the time of the ceremony, I kept thinking, I'm going to be splattered in blood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So, and also, we're, we laugh and said even Moses were trying to escape the rain and we were wet, cold, tired, but still happy to be in the forest. And 
you've worked with scientists around the world. What do you value in partnerships like the one with Bukidnon State University? I think partnerships and collaboration is the greatest thing that scientists can do because no one scientist is going to have all the knowledge uh, to advance science. For example, I really value the molecular data, but I don't have that lab gene. So I want to work with colleagues who have labs that can do that lab work because I know what species should be sequenced based on my field work. I know the questions to ask. And so collaborating with other scientists who have that expertise, we end up with a research paper that's stronger than I could have written by myself. So I always seek colleagues that have come and bring a different set of skills. And that research will always be more valuable in the long run. What I value most is teamwork and respect. When we work together, we learn from each other. Bookso has passionate people and good energy. It's inspiring to collaborate with people who care about nature and education. So how do you feel about working with Filipino biologists? I found it really rewarding and I've been really fortunate to find and work with three young students who I've kind of championed and mentored. And they've now all graduated with their master's degree. One just graduated with his PhD. And the other two are going to adventure for a PhD. So I, I feel it's like, you know, my brothers that I've actually watched develop in their early development here in the university now to graduating. And at some point are going to be the next generation of scientists here in Mindanao. Yeah, I can still recall that I was also mentored by our common friend, mm -hmm. uh, the late Dr. Benito Tan. And when I got the scholarship in the National University of Singapore, where I conducted my dissertation through Tan Ching Ki Foundation, it's been fantastic. There's a lot of talent here. Young scientists in the Philippines are smart, eager, and hardworking. I think the future of bryophyte research in Southeast Asia is very bright, and the Philippines will lead the way. Right. I think it's important to scientists that we really champion and bring the next generation along, pass the baton. Probably the worst thing that scientists could do is take our science and the data to the grave and not pass the knowledge on to the next generation. So what advice would you give to young people who want to study mosses or biophytes or work in the forest? Well, it's going to be a challenge. There's a, a quite a large um, learning curve because the terminology is different. How we survey for bryophytes is different than flowering plants, how we identify them. So you have to have a passion to want to do it. And but it's so rewarding and you can do it for your whole lifetime. It never ends exploring. And the great thing about this, I've been doing this for decades, and I know we go out in the field this week at Calatucan, yeah. we're going to find things that I've never seen before. Yeah. And that happens every trip. Yeah. Be curious. Don't be afraid to look closely at small things, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, maybe tiny, but they tell big stories. Take your time. Find mentors and enjoy learning. There's still so much to discover. So what role do mosses play in the environment, especially here in tropical countries? Bryophytes in tropical environments are essential. In fact, without them in these forests, we'd be in big trouble. They're, they provide the homes for countless invertebrates, whether they be snails or, or beetles or insects of all kinds and spiders and worms. Uh, that's a food source. So these are like the condominiums of the forest. They also absorb so much rainwater and up to 20 times their surface area and water they can hold. And they release that water slowly back into the environment. So they regulate a lot of environments, a lot of water and a lot of chemistry in the forests. So they're critical for holding soil in place from uh, floods and landslides. So they, they produce a lot of value to us as society, even though they're small, uh, they do a lot of big things. Yeah. And mosses absorb four times more carbon dioxide than trees. And tribes without soil and cool urban spaces, yeah, they hold water, clean the air, provide homes for tiny organisms, and signal environmental change. Mm -hmm. And quiet but essential, mosses work every day to keep ecosystem healthy. Do you have any future dreams for work here in the Philippines? 
well, you know, I'm getting old and older, but as long as I can still hike, I'm coming back. And so I'm hoping to challenge and uh, through our partnerships here at Booking on State that we start identifying other places that we can go uh, work with the tribal leaders and DNR, get the GPs and identify these places that no one has ever sampled before and see what's out there in these parts of Mendenhall and then determine what really is the rarest of the rare species uh, for us to do conservation. Yeah. What message do you want to share with our listeners, students, teachers, nature lovers about mosses? Well, because they are such small plants, it's very hard for us to name them all in the field. Sometimes there's a lot of lookalikes or things that we just can't be sure what they are. So they do require a small little sample to come back to the museum. And that's the importance and value of a barrier. Mm -hmm. So uh, these cameras today are pretty amazing. Some of these cell phone cameras and these uh, handheld cameras with stacking images can really make some phenomenal bryophyte pictures. And this is a great way um, to learn the common, the more showy species out in the forest. So mm -hmm. taking pictures is great. And then having a voucher specimen in an herbarium is even more important. Don't ignore the small things. Mosses, liverworts, and hornworts are like nature's quiet workers. They're everywhere on walls, rocks, trees, and they've been here for millions of years. When you learn to appreciate them, you start seeing nature differently. Finally, what would you say to our aspiring botanists and environmental heroes? I would say never stop learning. Never stop exploring because they'll keep you young at heart. And the best thing you'd always do is continually learn. I mean, I would never stop learning. Yeah. You know, just like keep going. Keep going. Wherever you're studying big trees or right. tiny mosses, right. liverworts, right. hornworts, or your work matters. Nature needs more protectors, mm -hmm. observers, and storytellers. And remember, some of the most powerful lessons come from the smallest green things. Thank you for joining us today on Botanica Talks. May this conversation with Mr. James Archevok remind us that even the smallest plants like mosses, liverworts, hornworts carry the biggest lessons about resilience, biodiversity, and the beauty of collaboration across continents. This is Dr. Leslie Casas Lubos. Until next time, keep exploring, keep discovering, and above all, keep safeguarding the richness of our botanical legacy for future generations. Only here on Botanica Talks.